it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Well, I'm very happy to announce that I'm once again doing a Richard Saxon story for you this evening. Now, before we get started, I'd like to point out that he's got a new book just about ready to be released, and it's now available on pre-order at Amazon, but more details in the video description below, so please do your best to support him and buy his book. You won't regret it, I promise. Now, on to tonight's tale. I don't know how you'll receive this message, but you need to wake up. Part 1 I don't know how you'll receive this message, but you need to wake up. Those were the words that occupied my television screen. Moments before, I'd been watching an old western movie with my wife sleeping peacefully in my lap. It was just past midnight, which meant I must have dozed off at some point, as the last time I checked it had been just past ten, and work in the morning would be another exhausting adventure. But the words that had replaced the movie brought me straight back to attention. The world you live in is wrong. Wake up, Jack. I sat frozen in my comfortable chair, momentarily forgetting everything that existed around me. The name, as generic as it was, felt familiar, but it wasn't mine. My wife let out a slight groan, probably dreaming something and talking in her sleep as she often did. I considered if I'd actually fallen asleep myself, if I was dreaming. The only way to make sure was by letting someone else confirm what I was actually seeing. Mary, honey... Wake up, please, I said as I gently shook her. She looked so calm, as if all the horrors in the world didn't matter as long as she was safe by my side. I took a moment just to admire her, and when I looked back up, the weird message had been replaced by the roll credits of the Western movie. The clock read 1.34am, meaning more than an hour had passed since the disturbing message had popped up. Time had skipped, but to me, no more than a few seconds had passed. I remembered then that looking at the time while dreaming produces weird results. It had to be a nightmare, nothing more, and yet I couldn't bring myself to wake up. I convinced myself that the message had been a product of my sleep-deprived mind, that I existed somewhere on the edge of reality with one foot inside the realm of sleep. Defeated and not feeling ready to get up for work in the morning, I just picked up a blanket and tucked my wife in. I was considering whether or not just to carry her with me to bed. It wouldn't be too hard considering my size, but I didn't want to wake her. And before I knew it, I suddenly found myself halfway up the stairs, walking towards our bedroom. I took a glance at my watch. The time read 2.04am. Another half hour had just vanished. And the realisation hit me like a brick. I'd never sleepwalked before, nor did I have any history of absent seizures. Then I noticed the painting on the wall. It was one that had always been there, but one that I'd never taken a second to just observe. Realistically, I knew my wife had hung it up there when we moved in together, but it was so distant, as if it only partially existed when no one was looking. And depicted a group of people standing outside an ancient building, all of them wearing strange black gowns. In the dark, I couldn't really tell whether it was a painting or an actual photograph, but my mind leaned towards the former. They were holding hands, but a lot of them were missing body parts, hands, legs, one even half their head, and none of them were smiling. At the bottom, there was a piece of handwritten text. Trial and Error. The First Test. 2013, it read. Well, the year felt so odd. Both the building and the outfit seemed so much older. Just staring at it produced a growing feeling of dread within my body. Goosebumps formed on my arms, and I knew that time had come to get some much-needed shut-eye. No sooner had I made that decision, before the world turned dark around me. Seconds, or maybe minutes, passed, and I awoke in my bed with my wife sleeping beside me. The sun had just arisen above the horizon, letting rays of warm sunlight penetrate our beige curtains. The events of the past night were already fading. It had to have been a dream. There was no other logical explanation. 
Are you okay? Mary asked with a tired, groggy voice as she noticed me staring out into the world outside. I was standing in front of the window wearing the shirt and trousers I always put on for work. I couldn't remember standing up or getting dressed. You look tired. Couldn't you sleep? I, uh, I, I don't know, I stuttered. I had some weird dreams. The light outside looked so strange. It was perfect in every sense of the word, rid of any obvious faults. It shone brightly through the clear blue sky, only interrupted by a few pure white clouds. A brilliant orange gradient painted the horizon with trees dancing gently in the wind. Well, that's the third time this week, Gary. Gary, that was my name, though it felt all too foreign. I'd known it since I could form coherent words as a child, and yet somehow it didn't suit me. Maybe you should schedule another appointment with Dr. June, Mary suggested. I agreed only because I'd known him for years. He'd helped me through some trauma, though. I couldn't fathom how he'd possibly analyze my dreams in any meaningful way. I called him after breakfast, and to my luck, he just happened to have a free session that morning. I let my job know I'd be late due to an appointment, and as usual, they were more than happy to accommodate me. Gary, it's great to see you on this fine morning, Dr. June said with his usual level of enthusiasm as he welcomed me into his office. He'd always called me by my first name, claiming it made people feel more comfortable, letting them open up more. Well, I couldn't deny that claim. The man knew pretty much everything about me. I told him about my dreams, and he jotted a few notes down into his book as he passively listened. Gary, why don't you tell me more about what you think these dreams mean? Well, it was such an obvious question, yet I never saw it coming. I hadn't thought much about it. My concern was mainly getting rid of them, not understanding them. Though lately I'd struggled to figure out whether or not they were truly dreams and not a twisted version of reality. It's some... Um, it's like my life isn't real, I finally answered. Sometimes I have flashes, pictures of people I don't know, but they all seem so familiar, I don't understand. He asked a few more questions after that, before sighing and looking at me. Gary, we've been talking about your dreams now for the better part of this year, and they're not getting better. While I'm not ready to give you a certain diagnosis, I would like to put you on some kind of medication. Drugs? What kind? I asked. He sighed again. Well, that's the thing, Gary. If I tell you how it works, you might be resistant to it. Now, this medication is brand new, I've had good results with other patients suffering similar world-breaking ideas. I'd just like to put you on it for a few weeks. If it works, great. We'll talk again. Well, if not, or if you suffer from any side effects, we'll just stop the treatment. I'm not supposed to do it this way, so I need to know if you're on board. I looked at him with a questionable expression plastered on my face. He'd always been good to me, never doubting or judging my stories. I trusted him more than most, so despite not being one to trust unknown drugs, I decided to give the treatment a shot. All right, Doc, you know best, I suppose. He handed me an unmarked bottle of pills with the simple instructions of taking one each day before going to bed. That was all it would take to cure me of an undiagnosed disease that had been plaguing me for months. Once the session ended, I headed to work on foot. My car was stored safely in a nearby garage, and I needed the fresh air to clear my head. My mind drifted to the deepest parts of my mind, and as it did, the same weird flashes passed before my eyes. Images of people, places and times that felt familiar, yet all too distant. They weren't mine, they couldn't possibly be, and yet they were there. I was only jolted back to the world outside as I heard the faint sounds of someone crying. It was a girl, sobbing in the distance. Her voice echoed unnaturally through the busy streets, and while it took me a while to pinpoint their exact origins, I saw her standing in an alleyway on the other side of the road, ignored by the dozens of pedestrians walking by. I hesitated for a moment, worrying that it might look odd for a massive guy to approach a strange child, but I figured I could help by at least calling the police or aid her in finding her parents. Hey, are you okay? 
I asked as calmly as I could while I approached her. She couldn't have been older than eight. She wore a school uniform and had bright blonde hair. Where's your mum and dad? I asked. She looked at me with a mildly shocked expression on her face. They're not here. I want to go home, she said. Where do you live? She looked around herself. I don't know. I don't like it here. This isn't real. I want to go home, she repeated. What do you mean this isn't real? Nothing's real. My parents are gone. The new ones aren't the real ones. They're not my real parents. No one's real. She was getting increasingly more upset with each question, but what she said struck an eerie chord with me. Before I got the chance to ask any further questions, I heard the sound of sirens appear behind me. A police car parked on the side of the road, and a couple of police officers emerged. Joanna, one of them asked. The little girl looked at me. Don't let them take me, she yelled with fear in her voice. Joanna, it's okay. We're going to bring you back to Mummy and Daddy, the policeman said. No, she screamed in protest as he approached her. You're not real. Go away. I looked back and forth between the little girl and the police officers that seemed as confused as myself. Hey, um, wait a minute, I tried to interject. Sir... The girl's sick. She needs help. They argued back before I could make my case. Yeah, but... Uh, Just stay back, all right. We'll take care of it from here. She turned around to run, but there was only one exit out from the alleyway, and it was blocked by the officers. Though my first instinct was to help, I didn't want to get arrested, or worse. They seemed genuinely interested in helping her, and logically I could understand why. But despite their actions making perfect sense, the situation just didn't sit right with me. Please don't let them take me away, she cried again. But she was taken away before I could probably process what had happened. In my mind, I promised myself to call and check up on her. But once she was out of sight, it was as if my brain struggled to recall what had happened just moments before. Whatever the case, work beckoned and I had to go. Well, it wouldn't be a particularly productive day, but my job entailed little more than tedious paperwork. Whether or not I was actually working, no one would ever know, as long as I pretended to look busy. Once at my desk, I pulled the bottle of pills out to study them. The box wasn't labelled, nor did it come with instructions. It was just a container holding thirty small, white and indistinct pills. I rolled one of them between my fingers trying to understand how something so small could possibly change my life. While the little pill lay in my hand, my computer screen suddenly came to life. It was just a black image with a bit of text centered in the middle. Don't do it, Jack. It lasted for a split second before going back to normal. Just that simple message. Nothing more, nothing less. Whether they were talking about the pills or if they meant something else entirely... I didn't know. Whatever the case, I couldn't stay at work. I told my boss I was feeling sick, and like the great man he'd always been, he let me go home early. Once there, I just collapsed on the couch in front of the TV. Mary wouldn't be home for several hours, working overtime trying to complete a project, but I didn't mind. I made my way to the fridge looking for some food. There was a plate of my favourite meal there prepared by my wife. I know you're under a lot of pressure. I just want you to know that I'm always here for you. Hopefully this makes you feel a little better. Love you, Mary. I had a brief smile break out. The first one in over a week. She truly was the best thing that had ever happened to me. I needed to get healthy again, if only for her sake. A modicum of happiness built up inside me as I devoured the meal in front of the television. Each bite as perfect as the last. On the side table beside me stood the bottle of pills, and the time for the first one was nearing. I picked it up and held it in my hands as I kept my eyes glued to the movie I was watching. Then, as I twisted the lid off, I felt a sinking feeling in my gut. Then the television screen turned dark, filled with little more than a simple sentence. Don't take the pill, Jack. 
and that was the last push I needed to bring me over the edge. I didn't know whether or not I'd lost my mind, but I didn't care. What the fuck do you want from me? I shouted at the television. Look at the painting, was all I got in response. Well, at first I didn't understand what they meant. It was such a nonsensical message on its own, but... Then I realized how I'd been extraordinarily fascinated by the painting on the stairs the day before. How I'd been frozen in place before it for almost an hour. The black screen turned back to the movie, and I put the bottle of pills down. I walked over to the stairs with the weird picture hanging on the wall halfway up. The sun had just set, casting eerie shadows throughout the house. It obscured the picture to the point where I still couldn't tell whether it was a photograph or a realistic painting. Time passed, and it started getting darker outside. And still, I just kept staring, not sure what I was looking for. Gary, what the hell are you doing? My wife called as she found me standing on the stairs. I've been trying to call you for hours. Why didn't you pick up? Hours had passed, and evening had turned into early night. It had just passed 11pm, and Mary had been stuck working overtime, trying to get in touch. And I'd been standing there, staring at the picture for hours. The picture? Where did you get it? I asked. Mary looked at me, dumbfounded, before turning her attention towards the picture on the wall. A confused expression formed on her face, and she approached me to inspect it. I don't really know. I never noticed the picture before. It was just, well, kind of there. Her comment confirmed every bit of oddity surrounding the picture. I reached out my hands to remove it, but Mary grabbed my arm before I could touch it, stopping me. Why are you stopping me? I asked. I, I don't know. I'm just... Well, I'm just scared. I felt it too, the hesitation and worry about what lay behind it. Still, I grabbed it and unhinged it from the wall. Once gone, all it revealed was a spot of absolute nothing. What's that? Mary asked in shock. I hadn't the faintest clue how to answer the question, because what existed behind the painting was literally nothing a hole in the fabric of reality that had existed long before our times in that house. Well, at least I knew it wasn't just a dream. The world was real, but something had gone horribly wrong, and for some reason, I knew it would only get worse from there. Part 2 It wasn't an easy task to comprehend the mess in front of us. The emptiness didn't just appear as a black hole or invisible surface. It was more akin to what one experiences when closing one eye and trying to explain what it sees. Not darkness, nor colours. Simply nothing. Gary, please talk to me, Mary begged as we stared at the break in reality. I looked over to the pills on the table back in the living room. They seemed so sinister then, as if the psychiatrist knew what I was about to experience. There wasn't anything wrong with me. Instead, it was the world that had been damaged. Then I turned to my wife to embrace her, to reassure her that everything would be alright despite not believing it. But as I went to wrap my arms around her, the world around me simply vanished beneath my feet. I fell into an infinite void of darkness before finally feeling an electric jolt surge through my body. When I opened my eyes once again, the world around me was blurry. I reached out my arms to gain a better understanding of my surroundings, but they were too weak and in pain. Apart from wriggling around, I could barely move. That's when I realized I was locked inside a glass capsule. Something was knocking on the glass, a woman standing on the other side. Jack, she yelled. I tried to respond, but there was something in my mouth. A tube that forced air into my lungs, expanding and deflating them against my will. It was a life support system, but not one found in any hospital. I used all my strength just to reach out my hands, silently begging for the person on the other side to save me. But before they ever got the chance, 
I was slung back to the reality I'd come from. Mary stood over me, trying to shake me awake. Gary, please, she yelled as I regained consciousness. I was lying on the floor, soaked in sweat. I felt unnaturally cold, as if my body had been dead for hours, completely stiff and pale. Did you see that? I asked with a groggy voice. See what? You just passed out. There was a woman. She called me Jack, I said. You were passed out, Gary. It wasn't real. I wasn't entirely convinced, but the memories were fading all too fast, akin to a dying dream in the early morning hours. For each second that passed, the images of the glass tank and the woman standing above me were disappearing from my mind. I redirected my attention towards the empty space on the wall. It was an impossible phenomenon, one neither of us had the comprehension to explain. Before we got the chance to discuss the matter any further, a loud beep emitted from our television. We turned around, peeking into the living room, where a single word had been plastered onto the screen. RUN! For a moment I just stood there, dumbfounded and still unconvinced that I hadn't absolutely lost my mind. It wasn't until Mary spoke before I snapped back to reality. What's happening? she asked. I... I don't... I don't know. Then the screen changed. They're coming, it said. Gary? Mary tried to say, but we were interrupted by a loud knocking on the door. Mr. Widmore, open up, a manly voice said from the other side. What's going on, Gary? Mary asked. Look, I don't know. Stay here. I opened the door to find two men dressed in dark uniforms. They were both armed, though they weren't wielding their weapons. Mr. Widmore, you need to come with us, they said. Mary tried to protest, but they ignored her. I tried to calm her down as they ushered me towards their car. Well, as much as I begged for answers, they wouldn't give me any. I turned around to say goodbye to my wife, at which point they violently grabbed my arm. Take care of her, one of the men said. The other nodded in response before approaching Mary. Well, she tried to walk backwards away from them, but the man was too fast. He gently touched her shoulder causing her to freeze in place, her eyes lighting up with panic. You leave her alone, I yelled, but it was too late. Mary had been frozen in place by an unseen force. Her shoulder was locked midair, and whatever was affecting her seemed to be spreading. I can't, I can't breathe, she managed to say before her entire chest had been locked solid. It was as if time had stopped only for her, freezing each atom within her body in place. Mary! I screamed. The two men then pulled me into a car, too strong for me to even think about resisting. Once inside, one of them picked up a radio attached to the dashboard. Initiate protocol B7 at Stanford Street 7, the man said into the radio. A distorted voice responded, confirming the order. I looked down at my arm. Red marks had formed exactly where they grabbed me. It hurt, even burning as if someone had lit a fire on with invisible flames. And the sensation seemed to dig its way through my skin, filling my veins and spreading up to my arm. What did you... I started to say as my words began to slur. The world before me went blurry, and before I could process what had just happened... I fell into a black void of emptiness. As I lingered in my own unconsciousness, I saw flashes of places and people I didn't know. Despite the unfamiliarity, they awoke an undying feeling of nostalgia within me. I felt at home, though filled with oh, jamais vu. A voice called out through the darkness, breaking through the flashes. Jack, it whispered, wake up. With that, I was thrown back into my own body. I was being held up by the two men that had kidnapped me, and by the look of my surroundings, we were inside an elevator going up. He's awake, one of the men stated matter-of-factly. Oh, it doesn't matter. He doesn't have anywhere to go. 
There was only one button visible within the elevator, and no sign to tell us which floor we would eventually land on. Still, minutes would pass before the lift finally came to a standstill. The doors opened. I was pushed into a large empty room, too clean to possibly exist in reality. All it contained was a few chairs and a desk covered in documents. In the back of the room, an old rotary phone hung attached to the wall, with no visible cables connecting it to a network. Oh, what is this place? I asked, without getting a response. They put handcuffs on me as they forced me to sit by the desk, none of them speaking a word. They just stood there with angry expressions on their faces. What do you want from me? I asked. Do you know where you are, Jack? One of the men asked. He called me Jack, a name that wasn't mine, but that had become all too familiar during the past few days. The pit in my stomach was just barely alleviated by the hopes that it might all be a case of mistaken identity. That's not my name. I'm Gary Widmore. I basically shouted at the man standing three feet away. He shook his head. Do you really believe that? What do you mean? I asked. You don't belong here, Jack Lawrence. This isn't your world. His words resonated with me in the most horrific way. Parts of me knew he was right, but I couldn't accept it. My mind wandered back to the little girl I'd found in the alley. Her claims that the world wasn't real rung through my every thought. This world isn't real, I half asked, half stated. The men looked at each other, a brief moment of disappointment washing over their faces. Our world isn't yours to destroy, he said while ignoring my question. Unfortunately, as your awareness of your real life increases, the damage to your surroundings follows suit. It's our job to stop that from happening. Unfortunately, that doesn't leave us with many viable options. I looked around the room again. It seems so clean, just too simple to match reality. Not a speck of dust littered any surface, nor did it produce an echo as would have been the case in such a large, empty space. It felt as if the place wasn't trying to maintain the illusion of being reality. What are you trying to say? I asked, though I had my suspicions. That you have to die, Jack. For whatever reason, these words didn't scare me. Instead, my thoughts drift to the girl again, the only other person that had gone through the same thing. The girl, I mumbled. Hmm? You took her too, I said. The men looked at each other as if mulling over how to respond to me. She posed a danger to us all. We did what we had to do. You killed her? I asked half in shock. He just nodded. Yeah, though death remains an inadequate description of the process. Simply killing your physical body isn't enough. Your entire presence in this world needs to be erased. Well, I was conflicted. If our presence here would kill innocent people, I could hardly blame them for defending themselves. Still, she'd just been a child, and soon I'd suffer the same fate. Look, why not erase me immediately, then? Why did you bring me into this room? Because we need to know where the others are. <laughs> what others? The others like you. Intruders that belong in a different world. And with that, the man who'd been silent up to that point brought out a cable attached to a syringe-like apparatus. He grabbed my hair and pushed my neck forwards to gain better access, before preparing to insert the thing. Wait, please. But despite my pleas, they jammed the thing into the back of my neck. A surge of electricity shot through my body, paralyzing me instantly. I felt my mind disintegrate. The fabric of reality started to fall apart, revealing mere outlines of a world that never belonged to me. For a moment, I was connected to it, truly merged with each and every atom. For a moment, I could see everything and everyone in the entire world, with just a few strange identities separating themselves from the rest. I knew then and there that these people were like me, 
humans that didn't belong. Then, as quickly as the ordeal had begun, the information was stripped away from me. I was forced into the wrong world I'd known for my entire life, back in the room with the two men. Okay, we got it. Take him to the factory, the main interrogator said. Well, the shock from what I'd just seen sent me into a panic frenzy. Who were those people? Where are you taking me? I shouted. They unbuckled me from the chair, leaving the handcuffs on. But as they prepared to take me out of the room, the rotary phone at the back of the room started ringing. The men stopped dead in their tracks. Their calm expressions turned to ones of absolute terror. For a moment they just stared at each other, and the main interrogator nodded his head, at which point the second man diligently rushed over to the phone and picked it up. Hello? he asked nervously. The room fell silent as the men listened to the unknown voice on the other end. It was too quiet for us to hear, but the man's expression looked increasingly worried as the conversation went on. All the while, the interrogator just stared impatiently at his partner. After a brief minute that felt like an hour, he hung up and turned towards us. Who was that? the interrogator asked. They called from the outside. We have to let him go. Well, the main interrogator didn't even question the orders. Just pulled a key from his pocket and unlocked my handcuffs. It doesn't change anything. We'll still eliminate the others, he said as he pulled the cold metal off my wrists. Hey, do they say anything else? Yeah, he has to visit this address, the man said as he handed me a piece of paper containing a street name and a room number. On the bottom, a strange symbol had been stamped on. It felt very odd to look at, as if the mark only partially existed, vanishing from my mind as soon as I took my eyes off of it. He has to... visit the core? Are you sure? The interrogator asked. The man just nodded in response. And they told me to give him a message. What message? I asked. I'll see you soon, Jack. Those were the last words the men ever spoke to me, before they ushered me into the elevator. Well, they looked angry, but more than anything else, they seemed afraid of what was to come. I had been freed, but despite my miraculous escape from the facility, I didn't feel safe. After all that, I hadn't the faintest clue where I was going. Still, I had a sinking feeling of absolute dread building up within me. A certainty that, no matter what I did, things would only get worse from there. Part 3 As the elevator lowered me towards the ground floor, I looked at the address. I recognized it as a government building in the center of town, plain enough to fade from memory despite its massive size. I wanted nothing more than to just go home to see my wife, but the thought had occurred to me that even she might be part of the illusion. I needed answers, and despite my trepidation about visiting the core, I had no other options. The time skips had all but ended alongside my obliviousness regarding the simulation. The phenomenon I'd always thought of as an autopilot was simply gone, but with the awareness, I could suddenly see all the glaring holes in the reality I'd been living in. There were fractures in the fabric of reality itself, unknown to the entire population. Holes in the sky appeared and vanished in a split second. While they weren't world-shattering, they were obvious enough to break any illusion that the world was a real place. On the rare occasion that anyone blissfully ignorant would notice them, it could easily have been written off as a trick of the eye or tiredness. Worst-case conspiracies would arise, but to someone who'd just been awakened to the true nature of reality, it became painfully obvious just how broken existence had gotten. Was it my fault? The interrogators had mentioned that people like me could break the world, but... But was I truly the cause of all the glitches around me? For a moment, I questioned how everyone around me could just go about their days and not notice that anything was wrong. But I'd been a part of it myself only able to wake up when someone literally shoved the truth into my face. Reaching the government building didn't take long. 
I'd already seen it hundreds of times, but only then did I finally notice how out of place it felt. Though it outshone every surrounding structure in terms of size, it was such a nondescript and dark place. There were no people entering nor leaving the place. It simply stood there with open doors, seemingly forgotten by the world around it. Whether that was by design or a side effect of the damaged world, I didn't know. There was no security protecting the main entrance, allowing me to walk into the main hall, a neatly decorated reception. There was only a woman sitting behind the desk, and a couple of heavily armed guards standing by a set of elevator doors on the far side of the room. They stared at me in silence as I came in, seemingly confused as to how I'd noticed the place. I approached the receptionist, not sure what I was supposed to do, so I just handed her the piece of paper. She quietly took it, while the guards kept their eyes planted on me. As she read it, her neutral expression immediately turned to one of utter fear, similar to what had happened to the interrogators. You, you're one of them, she stuttered. One of who? Please, don't do it, don't destroy us, she begged. What are you talking about? I'm not going to hurt anyone. I just want to find out what the hell's going on. I want my wife back. They looked at each other, and the guards then approached us, with their weapons drawn. But the woman just shook her head at them, and they backed off. Just go inside the elevator. She'll take care of the rest. Who's she? I asked. Just go. The doors to the elevator opened up, and I stepped inside as the guards stared on in horror. Without me having to push a single button, it simply started moving upwards. It passed nameless floor after nameless floor, stretching for a distance far outreaching the height of the building itself. Just like last time, I started to realize that I wasn't being taken to a physical place within the building, but a different realm entirely, secure and hidden from the rest of the world. After what felt like an ungodly amount of time, I reached the top. The doors opened. Without really moving, I suddenly found myself within a plain, metallic room that looked far too clean to even resemble a realistic place. The doors closed shut behind me, and with that every trace of the elevator had been erased. It simply ceased to exist, or well, maybe it never had. Regardless of the case, I was trapped with no escape. Hello, I called out, my voice echoing back at me over and over. Hello, Jack, a female voice called back, but unlike my own, it didn't echo, nor could I begin to even decipher its origin. It came from everywhere and nowhere all at once, causing me to feel disoriented in the large, nondescript room. That's not my name. Look, I don't, e just don't know what this place is. I don't even know if this world is fucking real, but I'm not a bad guy. I just want my wife back. Doesn't matter what you do to me, she's innocent. Where do you think you are? The voice asked. I looked around the room, still not able to fully comprehend my surroundings. I... I don't know. What the fuck does it matter? I asked. Answer the question, Jack. I thought back to all the bizarre events. I knew it wasn't a dream, but the painful fact that my entire life was a lie had become painfully obvious. This world isn't real, I stated as confidently as I could. What does it mean to be real? The woman asked in response. It was a question I honestly couldn't answer. Though it sounded easy enough, the implications of any answer I could possibly give would have felt wrong after I'd spent my whole life in what could only be a simulation. Do you think that people here consider themselves fake? She asked. Suppose not. Then let me ask you this, Jack. Your friends, your family, your wife, do they not feel the same way you do? Does their love mean any less because of what they are? How about their pain, their suffering, their fear? Are these emotions not real? She asked. I... I don't know. Their emotions are little more than electrical impulses surging through an impossibly complicated computer system. Little charges that produce thoughts, ideas, and independent thought. 
How is that any different from how your consciousness functions inside your brain? Yeah, but that's different. I tried to begin, but it was a thought I couldn't logically continue. Yes, this world was created by the people in your world. But how do you know that your world isn't just another piece of the puzzle? The being you have named God, or the Big Bang Theory, how do you know that these aren't similar experiments conducted by creatures beyond your comprehension? While your universe might be on the highest level of creation, you could never know for sure. Just like the people here. I had so many questions left to ask, but one stood more prominent above all others. Why are you telling me all this? Because, Jack, your wife is threatening to end this world unless we let you go. Your very presence and that of the people like you will eventually fracture the fabric of our reality. That is why I need you to leave. If leaving is an option, why try to kill me in the first place? I asked, getting angrier by the minute. She paused for a moment, allowing the deafening silence of the room to sink in. None of it felt real. As the seconds ticked by, I started to hear the sound of my own heart beating. Because creating an exit leaves us exposed. It would be safer just to destroy you. She'd said it so matter-of-factly, reducing me to little more than an afterthought. We don't have much time. Your wife is looking for you she said. Mary, but I saw her. I mean, those men, they did something to her, I said with a shaky voice. Mary is not your wife. Oh, you're wrong. I remember her. We have a life together. You did have a life together, but that life never belonged to you. I was overwhelmed by this information, and though it was breaking my heart, I didn't struggle to believe it. Every odd occurrence, I mean, the weird flashes, the dream about the weird glass capsule. The world I'd been living in wasn't real. But it wasn't a dream either. It was just a place I'd been sent. But why or how, I didn't remember. I took a moment to breathe, wishing I'd been left in ignorance to stay with Mary. But I didn't want the one waiting for me in the real world because I didn't know her. What if I don't want to leave? I asked. If you stay here, everyone will die. And she was right. Just like the interrogators had said, my presence and that of those like me was dangerous. I had to leave. You can ask me one more question, Jack, but then it's time to go. I only thought about it for a second. If I was to leave everything I knew and loved behind, I had to know where I was going. Who am I? Your name is Jack Lawrence, the voice began. You are 29 years old. You worked as tech support for a law firm. In 2015, you went missing after a traffic collision on Glover Street, after a fight with your wife. The doctors who treated you pronounced you brain dead, but after your wife demanded a second opinion, you were sent in for a special treatment, where you were falsely pronounced dead. You do not belong in this world, Jack, and your knowledge of that fact has put this world in danger. None of these memories rang a bell, yet I could see vague flashes of them as the woman spoke. They were so foreign, so scary. It's time to go. Wait, I begged. What about the others? I mean, the other real people. I will destroy them. You're going to kill them, just like that? Wouldn't you? If a handful of people had to die to save billions, could you not make that decision, Jack? Oh, she wasn't wrong, but I couldn't accept that I'd kill anyone that easily, as true as it might have been. This is your last chance. You have to leave now, she ordered. How? You'll know as soon as you leave the building. And Mary? She will live. But once you're gone, every trace of your existence here will be removed. To her, you never even set foot in our world. She will live on as if you never met. The entire world will forget you as soon as you step through the gateway to your own world. Goodbye, Jack. And with that, the voice vanished, 
and I found myself back inside the elevator heading there. The transition had been so seamless, as if the room had never even existed. After all that, I still hadn't the faintest clue who I'd spoken to, or whether or not they were even supposed to be human. But regardless of who she'd been, she was right. No sooner had I set foot inside the elevator, before I knew how to escape. There'd be a portal created in the very same place I met Mary, down by the pier where we'd first met. I'd been daydreaming bumping into her, which caused her hat to be caught by the wind and blow into the water. Feeling embarrassed and partially wanting to impress her, I climbed down, naturally slipping on the rocks and stumbling head first into the sea. She laughed, and I never did end up finding her hat, so to make it up to her, I invited her out for ice cream. Yeah, that's where I had to go. The main source of my happiness would be the place that took me away. Once I reached the lobby, the guards just stared at me as if they'd seen a ghost. Their faces turned pale and their hands trembled. They were terrified of me. Why are you afraid? I asked. I just want to leave. But that's when I realized that my disguise as one of them had been shattered. They'd always known that I was dangerous, but only then did they realize that their world was a simulation. I looked down to my hands. They were messed up glitched as if my own body was disintegrating. I couldn't hide anymore. I knew it. I just never believed it, one of the guards said. God, it's all pointless. Oh, it's all pointless. And with that, he lifted his gun to his own head and pulled the trigger without hesitation. Blood, bone, and pieces of brain splattered onto the wall behind him as the second guard fell to his knees in shock. The receptionist just cried as she saw me, finally knowing that her whole world was a lie. From that moment on, any person that saw me, even for the briefest of moments, would know what the world truly was. I had to find a way to cross the city without shattering the world, but it was a futile task. However, not everyone that saw me reacted with fear or despair. Some even laughed, while others just didn't seem to care. Right then, I was happy that the world would forget me, but that could only happen if I left as soon as possible. But what I hadn't anticipated was the acceleration of the damage caused as I gained total awareness. The holes I'd seen were all growing, tearing apart the fabric of reality itself. Buildings were getting erased before my eyes, and people froze in place as their bodies ceased to function. As the people realized their world was held together by a thin layer of cables and code, it was simply getting too much for the simulation to handle. I started to run, trying my best to avoid people, lest the world tear apart before I could escape. While my own death had become the preferable option, I remembered the interrogators repeat that my demise wouldn't be enough. For the world to be saved, I had to be either destroyed or removed. Then I finally reached the pier where I'd had my first date with my wife. But this time the ocean was gone, simply erased from existence, leaving behind rapidly dying sea life on the barren ground. The sky around the horizon had shattered like cracking glass, but standing in stark contrast to the destruction, I found Mary standing by what used to be the ocean side, staring out into the distance. Mary, I called out. You're here, she said, obviously in shock. How did you know where to find me? I asked. I don't know, I just knew. I saw you in my memories, talking to that woman. I heard the truth, Gary. That you're not real? I asked. But I am. How can you say that after all this time? I love you. I have since the first moment I saw you, your clumsy self. How's that not real? Just because this isn't your world? It doesn't make our experience any less important. I grabbed her in my arms. Her body pressed against me as tears welled up in my eyes. We'd been through everything together, but staying behind would have ensured both of our deaths. I don't want to go, I sobbed. As I uttered those words, a hole formed at the end of the pier. Unlike the rest of this damaged, loud world, the hole was perfectly calm. A perfect black void to end it all. You have to, she responded somberly. 
I'll miss you. But that last part was a lie, and if she'd somehow been an observer to our conversation, she'd have known that. As soon as I set foot through the gateway, I'd be erased from their existence. My past, my present, my future, it would all vanish to save their world. I love you, Mary. And I love you too. But you have to go now. You have a life out there. A wife. <laughs> Don't live it wishing you were here. Don't give up on your real life. She gave me a final kiss before she let me go. The cracks in the world were finally reaching a critical point where everything was falling apart. I just hoped that it could be patched up in my absence. Go, Mary whispered. I ran towards the exit, giving Mary a last glimpse as I dove through the hole in reality. And then, it was all gone. I fell through an infinite void as my atoms were stripped away from my body. I tried to let out a scream, but Without a physical body, I could do nothing but suffer as physics itself failed me. But whether an eternity or a single moment had passed, I wouldn't regain consciousness until I found myself back inside that glass tank, filled with a strange liquid I couldn't identify. There was still a tube stuck in my throat, pumping air into my lungs and keeping me alive. Through the glass, I could see a woman fumbling around with some buttons. Hold on, Jack, she screamed as she noticed that I had awakened. And with that, the capsule opened, and I was dragged into a world I couldn't remember. Jack, I knew you'd find your way to me eventually, she said as she held my atrophied, naked body in her arms. But I didn't even know her name, nor could I recognize her face. All I had were a few nondescript flashes from our supposed life together. She helped me remove the tube from my lungs, letting the air burn them as I desperately gasped for each breath of real air. I have to turn the system off. They have to stop them from putting more people in there, she said. No, I let out in the weakest of whispers. There are people there. They'll die. They're not real, Jack. Yes, they are. Just let them live, please, I begged. The world around me went dark once more as I passed out from exhaustion, and it would be several weeks before I finally woke up in the hospital. By then, the entire facility had up to moved before the authorities could even be convinced to check it out. While my wife had spent a considerable amount of effort finding the place, she just couldn't do it again, meaning that there was nothing I could do to protect the world I so dearly missed. During the next few days, I was introduced to old friends and family, I even had a son, one I, of course, couldn't recognize. To me, he was just a kid I'd never seen before, barely seven. Oh, it might make me sound like a bad guy, but I felt nothing for them. I just wanted to go back and see Mary, if she was even still alive. Not that it would make a difference, because she wouldn't remember me. I'd be just another strange face on the street. The life I'd known had ended. I had been trapped inside the harsh truth of reality, and I didn't know if I could ever get used to it. I don't know who decided to trap me inside that place, or why. All I know for sure is that there are more people trapped inside there, and they need help escaping before the core can destroy them. So that was a truly weird and wonderful tale for you this evening. What did you think of that one? Thoughts? Feelings? Anything else you want to add in the comment section below the video? And as ever, I'll do my best to reply to as many as I can. Well, uh, thanks for all your suggestions on Sunday of what kind of stories you'd like me to do. I haven't ignored them, despite the fact that I've not exactly done your first choice yet. But, well, um, had a couple of things ready, and uh, this one just appeared from out of nowhere today. Like I said, uh, Richard Saxon... Please check out his book, and it's available now for pre-order, and you'll be able to get it very soon. So please check out the link in the video description below. Uh, much appreciated. Fantastic writer, and um, very happy to promote his work here on the channel. Well, enough from me for a while. 
what day is it? It's Wednesday already. Uh, podcast will be out again tomorrow night over on my second channel and available wherever you get your podcasts, Dr. Creepin's Dungeon. I'll be back here again on Friday. Um, still lots of things lined up for the next couple of weeks that I think you're going to enjoy. Well, till the next time, very, very sweet dreams. And bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.